Thank you everybody, I'm Doug Sillers. Um, I'm from the States, I'm originally from Seattle, but I'm traveling through Europe with my family and so I'm really happy to be able to come and chat with you all. I've been living in Dublin for the summer. We were in West Cork. I don't know if you can see that, it's really, there's a lot of sunlight. Um, but this is uh, Three Castle Head in West Cork. Um, I've been having a great time in Ireland, traveling with my whole family. Um, a little bit about myself really quickly. Ooh, it's beeping. Oh, I'm still in quick time. There we go. Let's go to there. All right. So I'm a freelance developer advocate. I do a lot of performance stuff, which I'm going to talk about today. I'm a Google developer expert. And if you want to get in touch with me, it's all Doug Sillers. So it's really nice to have a uh, unique name because everything is Doug Sillers. And my slides will eventually be at SlideShare slash Doug Sillers because that's where all my stuff is. <clears throat> so before we start talking about images, how many of you look at this cliff in Switzerland and this walkway that's like nailed into the side of a mountain and you sort of get nervous thinking about walking across this, it's called cliff walk. Anyone? Like you don't want to do that, right? So I walked that with my family. My then six year old thought it'd be great to jump. And so the whole thing rattled for the whole way which freaked out a lot more people. Um, but <clears throat> Erickson did this study a, about a year ago where they put sensors on people's heads to monitor stress response to different things. And they found that standing in line is a stressful experience, right? You have to wait and, you know, uh, what are you going to do? They found that standing on the edge of the cliff, you know, has a stress response and people are freaked out about that. But they also found that actually slow mobile experiences are more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. And so when there's a slow mobile experience, um, what we find is that our customers are feeling that same thing that you felt when you were standing on the edge of a cliff. And so we want to do everything we can to avoid that. So what happens when you have a slow mobile app or a slow site? Um, Google has found that 53% of users abandon mobile sites after a three second delay. Um, another site where they added a half a second delay found that people were more frustrated and less engaged. And um, with 100 milliseconds of delay, Walmart and Amazon found that they make less money. So these are things we definitely want to avoid. And then my favorite stat is, of course, that 4% of mobile fo phone users admit to throwing their phones when there's a slow mobile experience. So these are all things, obviously, we want to avoid. If you see someone with a broken phone, it might actually be your website that caused them to throw their phone and break, break their, their, their experience. So when we talk about what we can do to speed up a website, this is from the HTTP archive, and it looks at the top half million sites um, every two weeks, both mobile and desktop. And what we find, and this has been true for, for a really long time, is that images make up 50% of all of the web. So if we really want to make a big improvement on what we deliver to websites, if we can make images smaller, we're improving essentially half of the content that's delivered to the average website. So what can we do to optimize um, images? Maybe that's better. It's getting darker. We can't control the big yellow thing out in the sky. Um, I'm from Seattle, too, so I'm not used to this either. <laughs> um, so when we look at image performance analysis, has anyone used web page test before? Hands, web page test. If you haven't and you want to monitor the speed of a web page, it's really great. It's free. It's open source. You can, test web page, you can test your web page all around the world. Um, and they have mobile devices. You can test what it's like on mobile. Lighthouse, anyone use Lighthouse audits? It's built inside web page tests, but it's also in Chrome DevTools, another great way to look at performance. They measure things slightly differently, but Lighthouse, you get Lighthouse reports when you run, run web page tests, so it's kind of all included. And then finally, the HTTP archive, the way it does these performance audits is it runs web page tests on the top half million websites. And I think for July 1st, they're doing the top million and a half websites for desktop. So it's going to be like a crazy amount of data that we're going to get in just a couple days. Um, they're running web page tests and they run Lighthouse audits on all of these web pages. So we can actually see what's out there on the web today so we can learn what makes websites faster. And so I'm going to use this Lighthouse data to see what kind of optimizations we can make from images. And there are four optimizations that are in Lighthouse for images. We've got quality, 
We've got format, sizing, and lazy loading. And we're just going to walk through all of these to see what we can do to improve the performance. Lighthouse, as the way you figure out if you did well or not, today, they've got a grading system where zero is bad and 100 is good. Right? That makes sense. Pretty straightforward. And so let's start right away into quality. So image quality is one of these funny things. You, know, you can go into preview on your Mac and you can change the quality when you're saving a JPEG, right? And when you lower the quality, you can see the file size is getting smaller and smaller. Um, when you make the file smaller, you're, it's a lossy uh, optimization. So you're losing pixels. So the image starts to look worse. And of course, we don't want our images to look bad on our web pages. We want them to look great. So we need to figure out the optimal way to change the quality level so the images look great, but they also are small in size. So Lighthouse recommends that you save all of your images at 85% quality. Now the problem with 85% quality is if you use Photoshop or you use another tool or another tool, they all have a different definition of what 85% is. So no matter what, if you save it in different tool chains, you will actually get a different sized image. Um, but you can use something like Image Magic, and you just save it at quality 85, and it outputs a new image for you. Um, there's a cloud-based tool called Cloudinary where you can update the full image. And then in the URL, you just put a parameter in that says Q85, and it saves it as quality 85. That's too low for you all to see it. I'm sorry. Um, there'll be some higher up further on in the talk, I hope. Um, so when we look at the Lighthouse data from the HTTP archive, what we find is 43% of the web is doing this right. They're optimizing the image quality correctly. But we also see that one third of the web is completely not doing any of this at all. And so obviously those pages can have a great improvement in their performance by optimizing the images that they're delivering. We can look at those images, those websites that are getting the 33% that completely fail. And we find that the median savings over 3G because uh, Lighthouse tests over 3G. We see that the median site would be 2.8 seconds faster and use 412, 419 kilobytes less data. So when you start thinking about performance, if you could pull 2.8 seconds off the load time of your web page, that's pretty significant. And so we can look at what this looks like. Um, this is Mizzenhead Lighthouse out in West Cork. We were there for about a month. And I took this image. It's 2.8 megabytes on my phone. And I can optimize it to 85%. Uh, and you can see I've already saved 50% of the, of, the, of the kilobytes, right? It's still a huge image. I wouldn't want to deliver that to mobile, 1.3 megabytes. It might take a really long time, especially in West Cork. Um, <laughs> I was on edge for about a month. It's quite an eye-opening experience. Um, I joke that the lighthouse is called Fastnet, but the internet is not when you're in West Cork. Um, it's a lovely place. Uh, my Airbnb said, we have Wi-Fi, but they didn't tell us that it was hooked into a 3G router that was, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen 441,000 millisecond ping to Google before until I was in West Cork. Uh, that, so that's seven and a half minutes round trip, I believe, which is pretty impressive. Um, it got better at night when everybody's phones went to sleep. So if I worked like at two in the morning, it was great. All right, but anyway, 85%, it's a lot smaller. But can we do better than 85%? Like, that's what Lighthouse says. And in general, you're, it's sort of like the lowest common denominator. Can you do better than 85%? So here's the 50% image. You know, we shave off another 800 kilobytes. Um, you probably can't tell here because it's kind of washed out, but it's not as nice a quality. When I go to 20%, uh, you may not be able to tell either, but the clouds are all pixely, and it looks really bad. Just trust me, it doesn't look very good. But if I took it down to 20%, it's 274 kilobytes. So if we look at that, you know, Google says, you know, 1.3 megabytes is going to be good. Um, we know that the 20% looks bad. But where is it in the middle? Where's that optimal spot? And can we use technology to find that rather than to have, like, people actually looking at the images and trying to figure it out? And we can. There are some tools out there. One is Booter Ugly from Google. And it's called Booter Ugly because all of the compression engineers for Google live in Switzerland, and they name everything after pastries. They just do. Um, and then there's structural similarity. And so here's an open source tool that does structural similarity, and it creates that. Um, in Cloudinary, instead of Q85, I just say Q Auto, and it automatically generates that optimized image. 
um, just on the fly so it's ready for your customers and it's perfect. When I do that, the image is now between 600 and 900 kilobytes depending on which tool I use. And they both, the two tools do it slightly differently. But we can see, you know, from 2.8 to like 600 to 900 kilobytes, we've made a huge improvement in the delivery of this page. We can run these on web page test and I'm running them on a Moto G4 in, in the States, so it's actually a real Android device. And we can see the full size image is 2.8 megabytes, it takes about 17 seconds to load. And you can see as I get down to the structural similarity, I've made it three times faster. It's now under seven seconds for load time. It's still 620, 630 kilobytes, so it's still a lot on a mobile device. But we've made huge improvements just by optimizing the quality of the image. And so that leads us to the next optimization, which is image format. And so all of these images so far have been JPEGs. There are a lot of different formats out there. Here's again from the HTTP archive, different sizes for the different images. The average JPEG is the largest, about 47 kilobytes. Um, we can look at SVGs, vector graphics. They're XML based, so they're the smallest, right? These are all about five. The average size is about five kilobytes. And they're really great because you can draw a vector graphic, that's the Twitter icon, and you can stretch them to any size and they always look really, really perfect. And there are no jaggies. They're jaggies here because PowerPoint does not accept SVGs and so I had to put in <laughs> screenshots of the SVG and they promised, I think it was 2016, they promised they'd have that for PowerPoint Mac. So, you know, by the time we were, we're all ready to retire, it'll be in there. Um, but it's great because it's XML, so you can add this inline to your HTML and you can compress it. And so here's an example of, a low, of an SVG that I found on the internet. It's a, live on a website in Brazil. You may recognize this logo. It's of some social media company. And when I look at the SVG, I can open it up. You know, it's, it's, I can open it up in a text document. And what's interesting is down here at the bottom, I've made it really big. You can see that there's this thing from Adobe Illustrator. And the problem with that is when you save it in SVG in Adobe Illustrator, uh, this file is 1.3 megabytes on the website. And so when I clean it up and I go in and I delete all the Adobe Illustrator cruft that was added, I get it down to 900 bytes, which I can then gzip to 563, or I can use Google's Broccoli, which is a more advanced gzip. Essentially, it's a little bit better compression and it's named after bread because Switzerland. Um, I get down to 440 bytes. Um, so this website was trying to do the right thing. They made SVGs, but of the nine megabyte website, about 5.5 megabytes were these improperly saved SVGs that they didn't test after they pushed them live. So test, I don't know. Um, but moving on to like raster images, images that you know we use that we're more familiar with, not just icons and things. You know, we can look at WebP, and the average WebP is, you know, 22 kilobytes. And WebP is a more modern compression algorithm. It's only about four or five years old, whereas JPEG is from the 90s. So the same image can be saved in a smaller size. Really easy to convert a JPEG to WebP. You can use Image Magic. You can use Cloudinary, and here I just have it set to Format Auto, and Cloudinary will pick the correct format for me, no matter what browser I'm using. Um, so that same image of Mizzenhead, you know, it was 600 to 900, now it's 400 to 500. Cut off another couple hundred kilobytes. That's a huge improvement. Um, again, it's probably below the, the, the chairs here, but we shaved off another 600 milliseconds and another 200 kilobytes of data. Um, and so here's what you do in a picture tag. So you can serve the WebP, and if it doesn't work, you fall back to JPEG and then always have alt text for people whose images don't load at all. Um, now, you might be saying, well, WebP, what's the support for WebP across major browsers? And if you look at this, you're like, yeah, it's Google, <laughs> right? You've got Android and you've got Chrome, but in the last two weeks, the notes have changed dramatically. And the notes say that Firefox and Safari are experimenting with support and it's in development with Edge. So it could be by, by the end of the year, WebP would be a very significant alternative and cover most of the major browsers that are out there today. And so that's really exciting because 
Today, what a lot of people are doing is they're doing WebP for Chrome, JPEG 2000, which is supported in Edge, Firefox, and Safari, and has got similar compression to WebP. And then they have JPEG as a fallback, but that's three different images for every image, and maybe you could get it down to two very, very soon. So if we look at the support in the HTTP archive, um, only 15% of the web is doing this perfectly. Two thirds are not using image format at all. And so there's a huge potential here for websites that aren't using WebP to speed up. And we can look, the median website on 3G could be four seconds faster and 600 kilobytes less data. That's a lot. And again, this is uh, 3G, so if it's on 2G, if you can pull 600 kilobytes off of a web page you're trying to load on 2G when you're out in a rural, rural area, um, that can really improve the load time and maybe keep your customers around a little bit longer. Uh, the third one I'm going to bring up here is sizing of the images. So another way to reduce the size of the image, this is a church in Serbia. And as, if you look, you know, it was originally 1.6 megabytes. I do all the stuff I talked about in the last two sections. I get it down to 804. But the image is still um, 13 megapixels. And when you load it on a mobile phone, it may not be 13 megapixels. And the problem with this, of course, is you're downloading 800 kilobytes of data. And then the phone has to spin up and throw away all the pixels you're not using. So it's like a double taxation. You download this huge file, and then the CPU has to fire up and throw away about 12.4 million pixels. And if you're on a slower phone, that'll heat up the phone, right? And you'll start like, why is my phone getting so hot with this web page? And it's because it's throwing away like 95% of the data that it just downloaded. So it's like super wasteful. And the only analogy I can think of is like when you order something from Amazon and you order like two pens, and it comes in a box with like 15 feet of brown paper that you have to go through before you find the pen at the bottom of the box. It's kind of the same idea, at least I think so. Um, but optimizing the image size for mobile devices is a tricky subject. Um, here are all the Android devices that hit Akamai in 48 hours about Christmas time last year. There are about 6,600 devices here. The size of the box is how many phones of that type hit. So on the left in green, those are all Samsung S8s and S7s. Um, the color is how fast the device is. So green means it's a fast device. Red means it's really slow. And as you can see, as you come up to the Android event horizon over here in the corner, there are a lot of really slow devices that don't have a lot of users out there. But you want to make sure that your content is delivered correctly to those users. And so what we do on the web is use responsive images. And one of the ideas behind this is you generate a set of images that are 25 kilobytes different in size. And that way, no matter what, you're not throwing away 95% of them. You're only throwing away up to 25 kilobytes of data. And so here I generated a bunch of responsive breakpoints. I found one that was good. And now I'm only throwing away 100,000 pixels versus the 12.4 million I was throwing away before. So a huge improvement. I used a tool called Responsive Breakpoint Generator. It's a web page. You upload your image. You set the different resolutions you want, how far apart the steps you want them to be, and how many images. It also lets you do cropping and things like that in different cropping for different types of images, like for the smaller images. Maybe for mobile, you want it cropped differently, and it'll do all that automatically for you. Um, it'll also do retina resolution if you want to have retina images for, for uh, devices that have retina resolutions. And you end up with something like this. And so I've got all of these different images deliver a different image at different, is that a laser on here? Maybe not. No, I don't think there is. All right. But you can see here at different widths, I'm serving a different image. And rather than look at the code, I actually have this on a web page, so it's more fun to actually look at it. All right, so this is the web page, and what I did is every 25 kilobytes, there's a new image when I resize it. Every other image is either sepia or full color, so you'll be able to see when I scroll when a new image loads. And so as I make the web page smaller, if I can click in the right spot, there we go. We have to get to the right size here, but you can see at the beginning, it clicks a lot because it's really easy. 25 kilobytes when you've got all of these pixels on two dimensions, it's a lot. And then, where did my mouse go? There we go. You can see, right, the 
exact same image is delivered to all of your customers on a really low-end device. It's going to be a beautiful image, but it might only be 15 kilobytes. It may be a couple hundred kilobytes when it's really, really large, but you're probably on a faster connection when you're on a really large a device with a large screen. And so you can actually see here um, every other one of these, I'm setting a width and the width changes. And so I'm doing that on the fly with Cloudinary. I'm setting the quality equals to auto. Um, and I think I'm also setting the format equals to auto. And then you can see every other one, I add a sepia command. So it's just doing that on the fly on this web server, which is kind of cool. It's kind of fun. And that's my demo in case the, web, the browser didn't work. And what we can see is we combine all of the data from all of these. Um, the responsive image, we shave off a good five seconds of load time because now the image is the right dimensions for the device. It's now 120 kilobytes versus a megabyte. So it's a huge improvement and, and we'll see that difference in the load time. If you want to do responsive images and image format, you end up with a whole bunch of WebP and then a whole bunch of JPEG images. And so this would be your picture tag you know, for just one image. You can see it gets really, really large, especially if you have a couple hundred images on your web page. Um, if you're into some experimental stuff, there are client hints in Chrome. And in client hints, you can send to the server the viewport and the width. And then Cloudinary, or the tool that you use, will, can analyze that width and send down the optimized width to your device. Why this is really cool is now you don't have that much code on your page. It's a lot more readable because you're down to just, you add one line at the top and then one line for every image, which is pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, it's a Google thing again. It's Chrome and Android. But, you know, that's, I believe that's 67% of, of the web right now. So it's, you know, it's, I think that's what Can I Use says. I think it says 57 or 67. I have to go back and look. Um, responsive images, this is sort of like we want to build for mobile. So a lot of people are doing this. This is like mobile first, right? We're going to optimize the images. So about 60% of the web is doing this correctly but a full fifth is not doing it right. So there's still a lot of room for improvement here. And though that 22% that isn't doing it right, again, is about 400K, 2.7 second load time for the median site, so the 50th percentile. So all of the optimizations I've given you so far are for a web page that looks like this. But how many web pages do you know that have one image on them? They're not a lot. So I think right now we should start looking at web pages that have like two images or maybe three so that we can see um, how we can optimize those. Because this fourth one is about lazy loading. And the idea of lazy loading is only load the images that are in the initial viewport of, of the device. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, a study came out earlier this year where they were doing eye, you know, how people use the web, and they found that 57% of users didn't scroll at all. They just look at the first viewport of a web page. And so if you're loading all these images that are way down, like three or four viewports down, that's making it longer for the web page to load. And it may be that 70% of your users never actually see those images anyway. And so just like the fastest code is the code that you don't run, the fastest image download is the one that you never actually download. So if I have this sample web page with six images on it, I could just not load those four at the bottom and that page is gonna load a lot faster. And so you can do that with JavaScript, and there are a whole bunch of libraries out there that will do that. We see that 60% of the internet are not doing that. 22% are doing a great job. This could also be single page websites that don't have images below the fold because there is no fold, right? There's nothing below. Um, so this is probably a, a false, it's too high, probably artificially. And what we see is those pages that are, not, that are failing here would be 3.5 seconds faster. 500 kilobytes of savings. So this is, again, a huge way to reduce the load time of your web page. So what do you put in place of the images when they don't load? And so what's really popular these days is preview images. You've seen this on dozens of websites out there, Pinterest, Medium, all of them do it. On your Android phone, if you search for cats and costume, you will see the same thing. You can see here, you may be able to tell, I can't tell from where I'm sitting, but um, this is a bunny rabbit, and this is pink, and this is a crocodile, and that's green, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, what this is a great, it gives the user the idea that an image is coming and then they can wait for that image to show up. So they're ready for an image to come. The other great thing is when you're reading an article, like a really long article and you know, images start popping in and then you lose where you're reading on the page, like that's so annoying. This helps solve some of those problems. Um, you can also do, this is an, so I took this picture of a waterfall in Croatia and this is an SVG representation. It's got like four or five vectors and you may not be able to tell with this, it's washed out, but it's lighter where the waterfalls are. So it's sort of an artistic representation of this waterfall, but it's 900 bytes uncompressed, whereas this is 100 kilobytes. So I can pop that in its, as a background image, and then this fires in its place when it's ready to load the image. And what we see with a sample web page, when I load it up, all optimized for responsive images and everything, it takes four seconds to load, 200 kilobytes, when I lazy load the images below the fold, I speed it up by a factor of two. I actually only removed two images, but I speed it up by a factor of two, 128 kilobytes. It gets a little bigger when I do preview images because I added a bunch of HTML, right? I added all of the, the SVG XML, and so it, it got, you know, a kilobyte and a half bigger and probably the same speed. You know, it's, it says it's a little faster, but we'll just say it's the same speed. So. These are the four optimizations that are in Lighthouse. So you can test your web page today in Chrome DevTools. Just go and run a Lighthouse audit, or you can use web page tests, and you can see how you fit with those. And then these are some of the optimization strategies you can do to improve that. And you know, I always wanted to build a 4D Venn diagram, so I figured this is my chance to build a 4D Venn diagram. And what we see is that 29% of the web fails on all four of these tests. So when you fail on all four, there's a huge performance opportunity there. There are a bunch of sites, about another 30% of the web is doing one, you know, but there's only about 20% of the web, maybe 25% of the web, that's really hitting that sweet spot of two to three to four optimizations that really makes a difference for speeding up images. So it's quite possible that your web page has room for improvement with this. And then just for fun, I thought it'd be fun to talk about animated GIFs because that's another thing that generates a lot of issue uh, when loading web pages. This is my goat Nora, and um, I also and so you know I thought well this would be great. I'm going to take this video with my phone of Nora eating food, and I'm going to make that an animated GIF because the world needs more goat GIFs. Um, now, one thing about animated GIFs is when you read the spec for the GIF, which was written in the 80s. In there it says, we have an animated format, but we don't recommend that you use it. <laughs> it says it. It's there. Um, so I made a GIF, 256 colors, 1980s, right? So 256 colors. Um, the problem is, I made it, it's now 270% larger. This GIF is 3.8 megabytes. That's not really good, especially when you want to deliver to mobile. And the reason for that is because GIFs are actually like a flip book. If you set your GIF to be 15 frames per second, there are 15 static images that it flips through every second. And so there's no compression through the time, through time. I can make that movie a lot smaller by going to 256 colors. I can strip out the audio, right? If it's a GIF, you don't need the audio track, so strip that out. Um, and then I can put it in a video tag. And so you have to set video loop autoplay muted and on Mobile Safari and Mobile Chrome, you have to set it to autoplay, but also to muted. And this is because when we're browsing on during a meeting, we don't want the videos to be really loud because then we're busted that we weren't paying attention in the meeting, right? So for it to play on a mobile device, you have to set it to be muted. Um, but the problem with this is that um, since video files are so big, they're always the browser always loads them last. They want to make sure the CSS, the Java, the images, everything else gets there. So your video is going to be the last thing to load. However, in Safari today, you can put MP4 videos in the picture tag and you can loop it. And so this works on mobile Safari and it works on desktop Safari and there's work moving forward to do this in other browsers. And so what's great about this is this is the same GOAT GIF. I can load as an MP4 in Safari. I can load it as an animated WebP in Google in Chrome or Android, because um, there is an animated WebP protocol. 
and then you can do the animated GIF as the fallback. And the great thing about this is it goes from 3.8 megabytes to 3 megabytes to 250K. And obviously, if you're on an, an Apple device using Safari, um, you're going to see a huge improvement, right? Instead of 22 seconds to load on mobile, it only takes four and a half seconds to load on mobile, which is a huge performance savings, um, especially because animated GIFs kind of are everywhere, whether we like them or not. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Here are a bunch of the tools that I used, web page test, HTTP archive, some of the tools I use for optimizing, and then Cloudinary is the tool that I use for all my demos because it's really easy to use. And you can just change parameters in the URL and it works automatically. And I'll post these slides tonight and post them on the meetup and um, tweet them out and all of those things. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And you can build web pages that use image and video that are, also, that are beautiful, but they also are delivered quickly. So thank you very much.